Hello, welcome back. The title of this lesson is Writing the Equation of the Line of Best Fit. This is part one. So students often, when they first learn how to graph lines, they ask, why are we doing this? And there are many, many reasons why we learn how to write the equation of a line. But in this lesson, we're going to explore one of the most practical reasons that we care about lines in real life in pretty much all of science and math. And that is, we're going to be recording data and drawing a scatter plot of data. And when you look at all that data, a lot of times you wanted to make a prediction about the future. You want to collect some data and then make a prediction about what might happen. It could be any number of, of scenarios. You might collect the prices of, of stocks in the stock market and try to make some prediction about what you think might happen in the future. It might be some scientific study where we record data and then we try to predict what's going to happen to see if whatever it is we're studying you know, is effective drug or something like this. And then of course there are many other situations in real science where whenever we're making measurements, like maybe we're making measurements of a new type of, of chemical compound, we want to measure different characteristics, but we have to do a bunch of different measurements and we want to, to see if we can understand how this thing is going to behave in different situations. So we have to record a lot of data and then make predictions. This is real life. Real life is not like a problem you solve and you just get the answer. Real life is making an estimate and seeing if your estimate is close to reality and then figuring out if it's close enough, right? So that's what we're going to do here. We're going to be looking at raw data. We're going to be asking a question about that data. And then we're going to use the line of best fit to make that prediction. But we're going to do it more, a little bit more mathematically than we've done it in the past. So here we turn our attention to problem number one, where we have a city which is analyzing uh, the number of light poles that are on each block of the neighborhood compared to how many houses are on the block. So we have different you know, neighborhoods and such. If there's one house on the block, then in one instance there was only one light pole, and in another instance on a totally separate block with, with one house, there was actually four light poles on that block. But then we also study the situation, well what if there's two houses on the block? Well, in one of those blocks, we had two light poles. Another block you know, down on the other side of the city with two houses had four light poles. And then yet another one with two houses had six light poles. You see the idea here. And then we have a few you know, uh, blocks with more and more houses. And we can see, for instance, when we had eight houses on the block, we had one instance where that uh, uh, required eight light poles and another instance where it had nine light poles. So this is just raw data. We have a whole city worth of houses to study, blocks to study. And so we do a little table to figure out what is the raw data. Now, let's draw a scatter plot of this and see what this data looks like in general. So we have a bunch of data points, x comma y, right? 1 comma 1, 1 comma 4, 2 comma 2, 2 comma 4, 2 comma 6. You see they each form a little x, y point in our scatter plot. And so we have drawn that here. 1 comma 1, 1 comma 4, 2 comma 2, 2 comma 4, 2 comma 6. These are all coming straight from the table. And then we plot all of them. Now we can see right away that there's a general uptrend here. And this generally means that the more houses were on the block, uh, for each of the blocks that were studied, and generally the more light poles the city installed, right? Now it's not always the same though. You see, for instance, here, when we had six houses on the block, one of these blocks had five light poles, but across town, another of these situations had seven, another one had eight, and another one had nine. So even when the number of houses is exactly the same, the city does not always install the exact same number of light poles. Okay, so there's some variability because these are built over years and years and years. I mean, they're not, it's not like a math equation. They just kind of like guess how many they'll need. And they, you can see that the situations are different. When we had, you know, uh, four houses on the block, there were all of these situations. Four lights, five lights, seven lights. Even up here, somebody installed ten lights for only four houses. All right, so what I want to do is, here's what we're going to do. We're going to write an equation of the line of best fit of that data, and then we're going to use that equation to estimate how many light poles would I predict on average a block with seven houses would need. And you can use this line of best fit to predict, you know, lots of situations, but that's what we're going to do in this problem here. So what would the line of the less, uh, best fit be through here. You can see that it's in general sloped upward. It's a positive correlation like this. 
the line can't be over here, it can't be over here, the data, it has to go through the data. It's gonna look something like this. Now, exactly where you draw it may be different than I draw. You may draw it down through these points like this. You may draw it through these points like this. What you're trying to do is you're trying to pick the line that kind of like bisects the data so that you have equal number of points on either side of the line. Now, of course, you're never gonna get it equal. You just have to pick what you think is the best representative line that cuts through the center of that data set. All right, and once you have that line, we say that that's a good line of best fit. Now, what we're doing now is we're just kind of like, by eye, we're trying to pick the best line that goes through. But as you go farther in math, there's actually mathematical ways to calculate the exact best line of best fit mathematically. Here, we're just drawing it by eye. So in this situation, we can see the red line here. Again, your line, if you drew one, might be a little different than mine, but this is what I consider to be a good line of best fit where the points were on either side. And also, if it's possible, you'd like your line of best fit to cut through at least one and hopefully two of your existing data points. Sometimes you can't find a line of best fit that actually goes through some of your data points, but if you can, it's gonna be way better to do that. In this case, we see that it cuts through two of these existing points. Why do we want to do that? Because I want to find an equation for the red line you know what the equation of a line is, right? Y equals mx plus b. And in order to find the line, you really need two points. And we have identified two points because it cuts through two of my existing data points, two comma four, two comma four, and six comma eight. Here's six comma eight. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use these two points which are on the line that we have for the best fit, and we're gonna write down y equals mx plus b, the equation of the line. That's why the first part of our problem asks us what the equation is equal to, and then we're gonna use that equation that we just wrote down to make a prediction, which is the second part of the problem. So all we need to do is remember that two points on our line, two comma four, six comma eight. We're gonna go over here to this board and we're gonna write that down. So the two points are two comma four and six comma eight. Remember, all you need is two points to define a line. Now, what is the very first thing we have to do? We have to find the slope of a line, which you already know is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Now, you've been calculating slope forever. Subtract the y values, eight minus four. These are the two y values, eight minus four. And since I subtracted this way, I have to do the same for the x, six minus two, right? Eight minus four is four, six minus two is again four. And so the slope is equal to one. Right, the slope is equal to one. All right, so we know, for instance, that y is equal to mx plus b. We have to have it in this form. We know the slope is one, so really it's just x plus b because m is one. So all we need to know is what is the y-intercept of this? Now we've done these kinds of problems before, right? Once you know the slope and all you need is one additional point on the line and you can find the y-intercept, we already know two points on the line. Now it doesn't matter which of these two points you use to try to figure out the y-intercept, they're both gonna give you the same answer. So I'm just gonna pick the smallest numbers because I like using small numbers, they're easier. So when y is equal to four, x here is equal to two. So I'm gonna put four into here and x is going to be equal to two here, two plus b, like this. I want to stop and tell you that you could use this here. You could put eight here for y, and you could put six for x. You're gonna get exactly the same thing. Maybe we'll do it here in a second. So we wanna solve for b. We're gonna subtract two. Four minus two is equal to b, because I subtract two from this side, subtract two from this side, b is equal to two. And so what we have figured out is that y is equal to mx plus b. m is one here, so it's x plus b, x plus two right here. And this is the equation of the line of the best fit. And that is the actual first part of our problem. It asks us, what is the equation of that line? Y is equal to X plus two. Now, before we go any farther, I wanna stop for a second. And I'm gonna show you that we can use this one here. We put it into this uh, position here. We put eight in for Y. Uh, and we say it's equal to X, which is we can put in for six uh, plus B. But you see what we have to do here, we have to subtract six. Eight minus six is equal to B. Subtract six from both sides, B is equal to two. You get the same Y-intercept. So all you do when you have two points 
is you find the slope, which we've been doing forever, and then you plug, uh, you put the slope into mx plus b, put it in the n position, and then you have y equals mx plus b, right? And you, all you need is one pair of xy numbers to stick in there, and it doesn't matter which a, a, a point you choose, as long as it's on that line, you're gonna get the same value for the y-intercept. This is the equation of the line. Now it's worth it to do a sanity check, y equals x plus two. Let's just see if this line makes sense. This means that the y-intercept of this line is at y is equal to two. And notice that this line does cross at y is equal to two. And we've also noticed that the slope is one because m is one. So that means up one over one, up one over one, up one over one, up one over one, and so this is the line of the best fit, or it is the line that goes through these two points, which we're by eyeball telling us that, telling ourselves that this is, this is the line of best fit or very close to it. There's, of course, exactly where you draw that line, it may change it, but it's very close to going right through all that data there. Now, based on our equation of the line, how many light poles would you predict a block with seven houses to have? This is the critical part of this lesson. Okay, anybody can find a line of best fit, but why are we doing it? Because we wanna make a prediction. We wanna say, okay, on average, how many lights do we need for a block with seven houses? But now we have a line that tells us, if we know how many houses X are on a block, tell me how many light poles I need, and this, uh, equation comes from the line that passes through the bulk of our data. So of course, some, some real life blocks have more lights, points on top of the line, and some uh, blocks in our data have lights that are less than, smaller than our line, just like some of the points are up, up on top and some of the points are down below, that's what I'm saying. But this line predicts the aggregate average because it's slicing through the middle of our data set. So it's telling us on average, you tell me how many houses are on the block X, and I tell you, on average, how many lights the city put on blocks with, you know, with that many houses, in this case, seven. So let's go over here and make that prediction. So what we will do is we'll come down here and then we'll say, we'll let X equal seven houses. Right, it's a very simple equation. Y is equal to seven plus two. Y is equal to nine lights not y is equal to nine lights. So, based on my equation, how many light poles would I predict uh, a block with seven houses to have? Nine lights. Now let's compare that to our data. In our actual raw data, you see right here, when we have seven houses in real life, what actually happened? Well, in one instance, the city put six lights. In another instance, the city put eight lights. In another instance, the city put 10 lights but our line of best fit goes through here. And so it's telling us that at seven houses, the line of best fit goes through here at nine lights. So this tells us that the line of best fit, based on cutting through our actual data, predicts that on average, the city should install about nine lights on houses, on blocks with that many houses. So if you were to do a wider survey and say, let me go ahead and look at like a hundred more situations and say, okay, all the blocks that had seven houses, some are gonna have more lights, some are gonna have less lights, but on average, the city should install about nine lights. You can see sometimes we had more, sometimes we had less, but this is an aggregate average value. That's what it's for. And you can also use the line of best fit to make predictions outside of the data you had. For instance, our data only goes up to nine blocks, but I could make a prediction that says, um, okay, what if I had 12 houses on a block? What if I had 12 houses on the block? How many lights should the city on average install? I have no data that goes up that high because I only have a maximum of nine houses. But this line of best fit keeps crawling up, right? It goes off of our graph. But if I had 12 houses, all I would do is I would put 12 in here. 12 plus two is 14. I would predict 14 lights would be required for 12 houses. What if I had 20 houses? Well, then I would put 20 in here. And I would say, well, 20 plus two, I probably need 22 lights. Now the problem is that this line of best fit was, was really calculated using the data I collected. If I start making predictions very far away from what the data is I have, then I'm a little less certain of the accuracy of it. So if I try to make a prediction of a crazy situation, like let's say there was like 100 houses on a block. Well, yeah, I could 100 plus two is 102 lights, but it's so far away from my data, I'm not totally sure that that's, that's gonna be correct. So 
what you do is you collect your data, you draw your line of best fit, hopefully you can get it to go through two of your data points, and if you can, then you calculate the slope and the y-intercept, you write the equation of the line, and you use that equation of a line to make predictions, either within your data cloud or slightly outside of your data cloud. The farther you make predictions away from the data you have, the less certain you are that what you're saying is true. What if I had a thousand houses? You know, I mean, it's so far away, you don't really know, but the equation does make a prediction, right? That's what we're doing. That is the point. So when students say, why do we need the equation of a line? I mean, there's tons of examples of why we need it. This is a great one though. We use it in engineering, we use it in science, we use it in biology, we use it in mathematics. Anytime you're collecting data, trying to make a conclusion, this is a very critical real world situation when you actually need to find the equation of a line to make a prediction. Let me take this down. We're gonna solve problem number two. All right, here's problem number two. Here we have students at a school, they fill out a survey. And the survey says, how many hobbies do you have? List your hobbies, right? And then based on the survey that they turn in, the students receive invitations to join clubs at the school, right? So people that only list uh, you know, one hobby, there's only really one data point, and that person was invited to four clubs. People that, you know, for instance, listed four hobbies, uh, one of these people received invitation to two clubs, another person received four invitations to clubs, five, and so these are all different people, right? And of course, it, you know, we have even more, more hobbies and fewer hobbies. You can see the person that, that listed seven different hobbies got invitations to, uh, of course, there's only two people that listed seven hobbies. Uh, one of these people received six invitations, the other received eight invitations. So each of these numbers here is a different person, right? Uh, and, and corresponding to the number of hobbies there. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna graph this data as a scatter plot. Then we're going to try to draw a line of best fit that cuts through that data. And we're gonna try to find the equation of that line and then we're gonna use it to make a prediction. Uh, and I'll reveal what the question is going to be in just a minute, but basically we'll use the line of best fit to make a prediction about some students and hobbies and number of invitations and things like that. So the data points we have, one comma four, two comma two, two comma four, two comma six, two comma eight, and all of these other points, let's graph it in a scatter plot. Here we have one comma four, and then two comma two, and two comma four, and two comma six, and two comma eight, and then all of these other points are coming straight off the chart as x, y coordinate pairs. Now, you can kind of see right away that there is some sort of correlation. I mean, I'm, I'm gonna be honest, it's not like, it's not like super tight, right? But because it's kind of like spread out, but there is a general correlation. You can see right here at the bottom that things are kind of trending up and here over here, things are kind of trending up. So we can see that as the students have more and more hobbies, in general, they're invited to more and more clubs, right? The students with fewer hobbies, in general, are invited to lesser number of clubs and the students with more hobbies are in general invited to more clubs. Now, what would the line of best fit be? It can't be like this, that, that doesn't make sense. We know that it's sloping up like this. Uh, it can't be over here, it can't be over here. It has to cut through the data here. So it's gonna go through somewhere, right? And you want it to go through uh, at least two data points if possible, because you wanna make an equation of this line. Now, this this could be a good line here. Maybe you've gone a little bit different. That's That's a little bit low, I think, here. I think there's, it needs to be more like this to cut through the data evenly. But it is a little bit of a subjective thing. So let's take a look at what we picked for our final uh, line of best fit. I chose something that goes through these two data points. I can see I have a good number of points on the upside, on the top of the line, a good number on the low side, and it seems to be relatively equally distributed on both sides of the line. You're never gonna find a line of best fit that's exact that's totally symmetrical, like a, it's just not going to, because it's real data, and it's not gonna be like a mirror image on both sides of that line. You're just trying to find the line that cuts through uh, as best you can, and hopefully goes through at least one point, and hopefully two of your existing data points. You may not be able to find that, but in this case, we found a line that goes through two points that looks like it's a good representative. Again, I'm gonna re-emphasize uh, re that when you get a little higher up in math, right now, we're drawing this line visually and just finding the best line by eye. But actually, there are ways that we can look at all of the data points and do a calculation to tell us what the best line of fit actually is. And the way that's done, we'll do it in a future lesson, is basically what you wanna do is you wanna figure out the line so that the the when you add up the distance to all of these points on top of the line and the distance to all these points that you calculate on the other side of the line, you wanna have an equal and opposite 
you know, a, a amount of points and distances on both sides, right? So basically there's an equation, a formula that we use in statistics to go ahead and figure out what is the line that gives us, gives me the same number of distance on top of the line and the same number of distance on the bottom or as close as possible. That is the mathematical line of best fit. Here we're just trying to draw visually the best line that we can see, which is here. And it goes through two points, two comma two, five comma eight. So let me go write those down, two comma two, five comma eight. 2 comma 2, 5 comma 8. Now you see why we want it to go through two points because the very first step is we want to figure out what is the slope of this line, right? The slope is, you know, y2 minus y1, x2 minus x1. So I'm going to take y2, 8 minus 2 there. So I'll put 8 minus 2 here. And since I'm subtracting this way, I go 5 minus 2 as well. So 8 minus 2 is 6, and 5 minus 2 is 3, and so the slope is equal to 2. m is equal to 2. All right? Now, the next step of the kind of puzzle here is we need to remember that this is always mx plus b. That's the equation of a line. And so, because I now know the slope, it's 2x plus some y-intercept b. But I don't really know what that is. I want to figure out what this is to find the equation of the line. Now, in order to do that, I only need one point, one xy pair, to plug into this equation because xy pairs that are on the line satisfy the line. And I'm going to pick the smallest numbers because that's just easier. When y is equal to 2, x is also equal to 2. If you uh, didn't use this point and put these numbers in, 8 would go here and 5 would go here. I'll leave it uh, for you to show, but you're going to get the exact same answer for b at the end of it. So 2 is equal to 4 plus b. Now I have to solve for b, I'm going to subtract 4. 2 minus 4 because I sub equal to b. Because I subtract 4, I subtract 4, b is negative 2. The y-intercept works out to be negative 2. And so y is equal to 2x right here plus the y-intercept, but the y-intercept was negative 2. And so this is the equation of the line, 2x minus 2. So I say y is equal to 2x minus 2. Now before we go on and, and do anything with this, let's see if this line actually makes sense. The slope is 2 and the y-intercept is negative 2. Now I didn't draw it. I didn't draw it, but if you extend this line down, then right here will be uh, right, uh, if you extend this line like this, it'll be kind of crossing down here. So it'll be like y is equal to negative 1 and y is equal to negative 2 because here is 0, so it's going to go you know, negative one, negative two, this is roughly where that line would cross at y is equal to negative two. And the slope is up two over one, up two over one, up two over one, up two over one. So the slope is two, which is exactly what we calculated here from the math. So our question is, based on our equation, how many clubs on average would uh, be, uh, uh, how many clubs would invite a student with four hobbies? With four hobbies. So this line predicts how many clubs they should be invited to based on how many hobbies they have. The number of hobbies they have is X, and the number of clubs they're invited to is Y. Um, uh, because uh, that, is our, uh, that is our invitations. Our invitations are the Y, and our hobbies are the X. So here we have X and Y. So let's go ahead and put in what we have there. And let's just go over here, and let's say let X equal to uh, how many? Four hobbies. So if I put four in here, what do I get? Two times x is equal to four minus two. I get two times four is eight minus two. Y is equal to six clubs. So on average, if the using the line of best fit that we have, if students were invited to four hobbies, on average they should be invited to six clubs. So I'll put six clubs. Now let's go and see what our actual data says. With four hobbies, we are basically, where do we live on this chart here? With four hobbies, we're here. What we're basically saying is that we expect to be invited to six uh, clubs, which is exactly what the graph is telling us. Now we could just, once I drew this, I could just answer the question by looking at it, but I want you to use the equation to calculate the answer because sometimes, you know, you don't have a pretty graph like this. You just have the equation. 
So with four hobbies, it's telling you on average you're going to be invited to six clubs. Now in real life, these students were invited to all different number of clubs. Some of these uh, students with four hobbies were invited to two clubs. This student with four hobbies was invited to four. This student with four hobbies was invited to five. This student was invited to seven. This student was invited to nine. This student was invited to ten. So there's a very big spread of the students there. But notice that the line cuts right through the middle, so it's an average. It's telling you like an aggregate average. The real data can be on top or bottom, uh, above or below the line, but the line is representing a single kind of like collection of points that cuts through the cloud of your data. Because in real life, you do have noise. This is considered noise. Some people are invited to more, some people are invited to less, above or below the line, but the line represents the aggregate average. And so the way this question really should be uh, phrased is based on our equation, how many clubs on average would, uh, be, would a student be invited with four hobbies? Now you could use this to make a prediction outside of my data set, right? Like let's say that uh, here we only go up to seven hobbies, but what if I invite some kids with 10 hobbies? There's no data at all up here at 10 hobbies, but I could put 10 in here, two times 10 is 20, and 20 minus two is 18. They should have 18 invitations. Now, that may or may not happen in real life because as I get farther and farther away from my data, I'm less certain. Like I predicted 18 invitations. Maybe there aren't even 18 different clubs. Like maybe there just aren't that many clubs. So you can't really make predictions very far away from your data, but you can make predictions slightly outside of and of course within your data set as well. Let me take this down. We'll solve our last problem. All right, for our next problem, we have a chart that we have students attending tutoring sessions and we give them more and more and more incentives and we're recording how many incentives we're getting this, giving the student and how many students actually attend tutoring. And what I mean by incentives is the teacher might say, if you go to tutoring, I'll give you five points on your next exam. That's an incentive, right? Uh, the uh, teacher might say, if you go to tutoring, I'll give you an apple, okay? The teacher might say, if you go to tutoring, I'll give you, you know, five minutes off, you know, to goof off in class, whatever. Those are the number of incentives here. And then, of course, like if somebody gets, gets four incentives, these four students uh, or these four, uh, 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 these four days when these incentives were given, you had four students show up, five students show up, six students show up, seven students show up. So on different days, the student may, the teacher may give a different number of incentives and we're recording how many students showed up at tutoring. That's what we're doing. So let's plot this data. When one incentive was given, we had two data points, one student, two students. Clearly that wasn't good enough, so we increase. Then two comma one, two comma two students, two comma three students, two comma five students, and so on. And we're gonna plot this. And here's what we get. 1 comma 1, 1 comma 2, 2 comma 1, 2 comma 2, 2 comma 3, 2 comma 5, and then all the other data points we have. Now we can see a very strong correlation, positive correlation. It slopes up and to the right. And we can see that in general, as we give more incentives, more and more students actually do show up to tutoring. And when we give fewer incentives, we have fewer students show up at tutoring. So this is a positive correlation of data. Now, what would be a line of best fit? We want to figure out, it's going to be some kind of line that goes like this. You don't want it to be down here. You don't want it to be up here. It needs to cut through the data, but it's a little bit of wiggle room. Should it be like this? Should it be like this? Should it be like this? And ideally, you would like it to cut through at least one data point and hopefully two data points if possible. Sometimes it's just not possible, but that would be the ideal. Now, in this situation, this is what I chose here. I said the line of best fit goes through this point, but it doesn't really quite hit this one. It doesn't hit this one, so it's not quite on there. It doesn't hit this one, doesn't hit this one, does not hit this one. It actually hits the origin down here. Now, ideally, you'd like it to cut through two of your data points, and I couldn't figure out a way to get it. I mean, I could have just changed the line, but it wouldn't have been what I think the line of best fit is. This is what I think the best line is to cut through my data set, but it only hits one point. However, it's kind of nice because it hits the origin, zero comma zero. So even though zero comma zero is not like in my data, it's a known point. The line here that we're saying is a line of best fit cuts through the point zero zero and it cuts through the point six comma seven. So even though zero zero is not on my data set, I know the line based on my drawing goes through that point. And so I know the line must go through those two points. I can see it right here and right here. So even though this is not actually one of my data points, I can still use this to calculate the uh, equation of this line. So I'm saying that by I, I can see that this uh, 
line goes through the point six comma seven and it goes to the point zero comma zero. This is not one of my data points, but I can see that it does go through there. So what's the slope of this line? Right, I can subtract any way I want. So I'm gonna say seven minus zero, subtract the y's and subtract the x's, six minus zero. And so the slope is seven on the top and six on the bottom, right? And then I say, well, what would be the equation of this line? Well, it's gonna be y equals mx plus b. m is seven, six times x plus b. Now I gotta find the y-intercept. Now I can put whatever point I want to put in here, I'm gonna choose this point because it's just easier to deal with smaller numbers, zero comma zero. So when y is zero, x is also zero. Now what do we get? Zero times anything is zero, so I get b is equal to zero. So I get the y-intercept is equal to zero. Okay, so then I say, let me go and write the equation of this line. y is equal to seven six, the slope, x plus b, which is zero, so I don't have to write it. This is the equation of this line of best fit. This, the y-intercept happens to be zero. y equals seven six x. Now, this obviously makes sense because we already drew the line on the graph and we can see that the y-intercept is at zero. So of course, b is zero. I could actually just read it from the chart in this case. I just wanted to do the math to show you that it get the same exact thing. Now. The question is, how many students do you predict to be present if 12 positive, positive incentives were offered? Now, my data only goes up to uh, a situation where eight incentives from the teacher were offered. <clears throat> so what about if they she gives me 12 incentives? It's gonna be way over here. The line is gonna be way up here somewhere off of what I've graphed. But we can still calculate it because I know the equation of a line. You know, when you, First start learning this stuff, you start using the graphs to figure everything out, but then you realize, well, if I don't have the graph, if I have the equation, I have the whole, I have the whole universe in my hand because the equation describes the entire line, right? So if 12 incentives are offer, offered, I will let, whoops, let x is equal to 12 because x is the number of incentives. So y is equal to seven, six times 12. Right? And then of course I can simplify. Six divided by six is one, 12 divided by six is two. And then y is gonna be equal to seven times two, 14. Uh, and I would say 14 students. Right? So the question is, how many students do you predict to be present if 12 positives and incentives were offered? 14 students. Does this make sense? Well, it's off the chart. But if this is 10, then you say 11, 12, then you kind of go up here and you sort of draw a line here, something like this, probably right around here, which is gonna be over here. Uh, it's 11, 12, 13, 14, that's pretty close. If I continued my graph, then I would draw this line up and I would be able to read it right off the chart so it seems to make sense. Now, can the teacher give me that incentives? Are there that many students in class? You don't really know. And so the danger, is yes, it's really good for predicting things, to, for making predictions, but as the farther away you get, if you get farther and farther away from your data, uh, then your confidence in what you're doing goes down. So for instance, I'm predicting how many students uh, will come if I give 12 incentives. Well, let me do another calculation. How many students will come if I offer 200 incentives? Well, I'm gonna get a lot of students, but number one, I may not have that many students in my class, and number two, I can't give 200 incentives. That's ridiculous. So yes, if you, it's good for predictions, but don't go crazy because as far the way you get, then you, you're, you get into ridiculous territory that doesn't make sense. This is just a line. It's gonna go forever. It'll make predictions that aren't physical and aren't possible if you allow yourself to do that. So it's good for making uh, predictions. Just don't go crazy with it, I guess is what I'm trying to say. I'd like you to solve all of these. Try to do three different types of situations to give you practice with what, what you're doing. Make sure you understand how to calculate these. Follow me on the part two. We will continue to build your skills.